Ali, over to you. Thank you, Daniel. One aspect that we wanted to bring uh, bring up during this slide is really the, the piece where we talked a little earlier about design excellence. And as you can see, this is an example of Southwest Detention Center uh, that we built in Windsor. And as you can tell from the facade and the way it's built, um, you know, there's a mixture use of, of, of brick, glass, uh, sometimes also um, uh, uh, wood features as well. And what we really tried to do is two things. One, we try to make it low profile. So it's not, you know, a multi-story building that would dominate any, any sight line. And two, we want to build a building that actually integrates to integrates with any other modern building that, that we are building uh, across the province. So, you know, an example of that is a hospital. And so I think as you can see from, from the outside uh, that, you know, it's, it's not, a, 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 you know, it doesn't look like a correctional facility. It looks potentially like a hospital. You know, we spend a lot of time designing, making sure that that we, we bring in design elements that, that integrate it into, the, into what's there locally. Um, as well, as you can see from the right-hand side of the screen, uh, this is the, the, en the entrance for, for visitors of that space. It looks like an entrance to, to you know, a, a, akin to a modern hospital as well. And so the perception, but also the interaction that we are trying to build here is one of not a correctional facility, but somewhere where we are truly trying to rehabilitate people um, and bring them back to their to their communities. And so hopefully just from this example, you, you can see that what we build is, is not something that you know, is visually of, of offensive or will dominate um, or will dominate uh, you know, the, the space that it's built on. So in terms of just moving on, uh, we'll, we'll hand it over to Daniel and we'll talk about the community impacts. Yeah, so if we can move to slide 23 and I'll ask Karen and Renew to talk about community impact. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniel. And in fact, um, I, I'm going to speak to uh, the uh, two of the slides and then I'm going to introduce um, our acting executive director uh, from my division, Lisa O'Brien. I'll introduce her briefly after I speak to uh, the next two slides. So if I could get to uh, slide 22, please. Thank you. So um, this is really uh trying to give a, a good sense of the fact that that this new complex um can have will have a positive impact on offenders we've we've tried to sort of talk through uh the new progressive approach um to working with our populations and our staff who really are very well trained and very very dedicated and good at what they do they really know how to run this business um, we run these correctional institutions across the province and um, we've been in this uh, in this for many, many years. In fact, more than a century, for example, in the case of Brockville, which was Brockville Jail built in 1842. So I just wanted to say here for the staff as well as for the region, there, there can be positive uh, impacts. As I talked earlier about using the capacity pressures throughout the Eastern region, allowing us to to modernize and use the other space we have in other locations well. Um, but we also are going to focus a lot on our supports for inmates. I've talked about the mental health um, issues and the additional space for programming and rehabilitation, really core elements of this. And I also wanted to say that, that this will bolster existing businesses and create new economic opportunities for the local community. Local businesses that, that would benefit include restaurants, coffee shops, grocery stores, convenience stores, daycare facilities, gas stations, um, and then local tradespeople may be contracted to do work during the build phase of the new facility. And after it's built, local companies may be engaged to provide maintenance services such as snow removal. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, and so once once it's built, um, the facility will provide uh, well-paying jobs, government jobs uh, in positions such as correctional staff, healthcare, uh, kitchen staff and administration. And as staff is hired for the new facility, local housing may become desirable for staff who don't want to commute to work. And that may provide an added benefit to local businesses um, and real estate uh, value. 
So uh, in terms of community safety, I will now introduce uh, my colleague, Lisa O'Brien. Lisa has grown up in the system. She has had a long career in corrections and she's a, a really good example uh, and role model for the kind of dedicated and very, very competent, well-trained staff that we have uh, in, in our correctional institutions. So Lisa is going to speak to you now uh, about this uh, topic of community safety as somebody who's lived it for many, many years in her role. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you, Edie and Alice, I appreciate it. Um, so in terms of bricks and mortar, the Eastern Ontario Correctional Complex will be built to a high security construction standard, as is the case for all of our provincial institutions. This ensures a safe and secure institution that will still be aesthetically pleasing to the public eye. As mentioned earlier, efforts in this institution will be focused primarily on rehabilitation and programming, predominantly for inmates who have medium and minimum security classifications. The facility will include a secure perimeter fence monitored using the most advanced electronic security technology. And the facility will be designed to provide many integral services, as mentioned earlier, including healthcare, dental, and video court suites, which will assist in reducing outside transportation and the presence of inmates within the community as much as possible. When it is necessary for inmates to be outside of the secure perimeter, they will be supervised by multiple correctional officers who are especially trained in community escorting. Inmate access outside of the institution's secure perimeter is limited to four categories. The first being those involved in daily in-person court movement, where the transportation is then provided by local police services and court services. Secondly, those involved in institution to institution secure transfers, which are also conducted by community trained correctional officers. And thirdly, those who require emergency medical escorted um, under the supervision of specially trained officers for medical treatments that are not able to be provided within the institution, as well as any inmates granted escorted temporary absence permits, and that is also under staff supervision. Our ministry does have a, a duty, sorry, to ensure that when released, inmates are provided transportation back to their home communities. Inmates who are not from Kempville will not be simply released into the local community. As an example, the Central North Correctional Center has an agreement with the town of Penetanguishene not to release inmates directly from the institution unless they have a ride to pick them up. Inmates are routinely driven from Central North for over 45 minutes to Barrie where they are provided with public transportation to ensure they are able to return to their home communities. As part of discharge planning within the institution, inmates are also routinely transferred back to an institution closest to their home prior to the release, making it much easier for them to get to their home communities. As we anticipate that most visitors to be uh, within a commuting or driving distance of this new facility, given the local catchment area, they are very unlikely to require overnight accommodations. Thank you, next slide. Uh, I'll introduce my colleague, Renu Kalundran. Hi, thanks, Lisa. So as, as Lisa and Karen have identified, uh, we are, are really about uh, making sure that inmates upon discharge return to their home community communities, but not just to their home communities, but that also have um, uh, connections with service providers and that can continue the care that they receive within institutions. So our whole approach to community reintegration is really about connecting inmates and uh, those who are discharged with resources back to their home community so that they can successfully reintegrate and have that supported continued care. So the ministry, um, both uh, working with institutional services staff as well as staff in community services, provides that uh, community reintegration planning to those inmates who choose to access this service. And staff, our staff collectively play a really important role in this process, including delivering programming before uh, an inmate is released and by making the appropriate referrals to outside agencies so individuals can access needed services and supports when they return home. 
we have many partnerships across the, the province with a variety of community-based agencies, including John Howard Society, Elizabeth Fry, as well as Indigenous organizations such as Friendship Centers that provide valuable supports that include housing, including supervised housing through community residential agreements and mental health services. This community reintegration work is further supported by our local probation and parole officers who assist uh, these individuals once they return back to their home communities. Staff who supervise offenders and ensure that uh, our clients comply with the requirements of their community supervision orders uh, is a part of this work. And probation and parole officers also support individuals in changing their behavior through programs such as anger management, substance abuse, and domestic violence. Indigenous uh, peoples may also be supported by Indigenous community correctional workers who are who work with us um, as, as part of a liaison with the ministry. And these, uh, these workers help Indigenous clients access culturally appropriate and responsive services and programming. Some individuals may also have a requirement as part of their community supervision order to give back to communities and probation and parole officers work with community agencies to connect these individuals with volunteer placements. All of these activities are undertaken with the objective of supporting individuals in their successful return to society and to discourage individuals from reoffending. Re community reintegration is a key priority for this ministry and we are working with ministry partners such as the Ministry of Housing, uh, the Ministry of Children and Community Services, um, as well as the Ministry of Health to develop programs and strategies to help support these in individuals throughout their rehabilitative journey and to promote the availability of community-based supports. Thank you. Thanks, thank you, Renu. Um, Robert Green, the Director of Facilities. I know a number of you um, are really interested in, um, have many questions about the construction of this new new facility um, and its impact on, on your community. Um, we have selected a few sites um, in our portfolio in the province of Ontario. I'll just provide some examples uh, of, of the, the proximity and, and of other establishments in the community, but also to give you a sense of how residential areas have developed around our facilities, uh, as well as, um, you know, including schools and high schools. Um, the first one that you see here on the left is the Thunder Bay Jail, um, circled uh, on the map itself. To the right hand side of it, you see that it's the St. Saint, Saint Ignatius High School. It's less than uh, 2.2 of a kilometer from the existing facility itself. One, one item that I would like to note around this one is uh, with respect to the Thunder Bay Jail, um, it, it was opened in 1928. Um, however, over the, the past century or close to a century, we haven't um, installed a security perimeter fence around this facility. It's one of the facilities that uh, does not have a um, maximum security fence surrounding the facility itself. In the center of the page, you see the North Bay Jail in the map circled kind of down on the south end of the map itself. Um, it's a maximum, maximum security facility. It was opened in 1929 as well, um, and it's been in the community for since, uh, since that time. Important to note, uh, very similar French schools within less than a kilometer of the existing facility itself, as well as the French, uh, sorry, an English school, English public school, 0.7 kilometers away from the existing facility. As you can see, um, highly developed residential areas around that, that, um, that facility as well. The one on the right hand side is the Ontario Correctional Institute in Brampton. Um, it was opened in 1973. It is a medium security facility with, with focused heavily on, on program, program delivery. Um, around this facility you certainly can 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 see that there are a number of establishments and schools in close proximity um the the john knox christian school is 0 0.3 0 0.3 kilometers away from the existing facility it's essentially right across the road from uh, where you enter um, to gain access to the facility itself the queen street public school is a half a kilometer away the, the ridgeview public school 
um, 0.8 kilometers away, and the Catholic school just a little over a kilometer away. The one other um, point that I want to just highlight in here is there is a youth facility that's um, in close proximity to all of these establishments as well that was recently built and opened in 2010. One other item that I would like to note about this particular piece of property um, is certainly the the interest from um, local developers and a municipality in, in having conversations with the ministry about the excess property that is at this location as well. So there is continued interest in, in you know, um, having conversations about the utilization of existing property and, and opportunities to, to secure that additional property for future development. Um, so these are just a few examples uh, of how these facilities have successfully integrated into the community uh, with no known issues or disturbances to those that live in, in these communities as well. Thank you. So I'd like to invite Ali and Angelo to walk us through the next steps. Yeah, I, I, do you want to start, Ali, or do you want me to go? Sure, I'll, I'll start, Angelo, and then I'll hand it off to you for the next slide. Thank you. And so as you can see, the timelines here, when you take a step back, really, it, it, is, a, it is a long timeline in terms of building an infrastructure piece like this. But this is not uh, dissimilar to any other piece of infrastructure that the province builds, whether if it's uh, whether if it's transit or hospital infrastructure. Usually, it takes about five to seven years to build uh, on something like this, and and that's why you see between now and 2017 that is really the, the lifespan of building this project, and then operationalizing it after that. The important part is is you know when you look from 2020, which we are in now, to 2022, it's really the part where we start. The, the first part of our engagement session. And again, I said this is a journey in terms of engaging the, the community and our partners. And the first part really has to do with preparing the proper design guidelines based on what we see from, from, from these engagements to make sure that, that you know, the design looks good, to make sure that the agency are good, looks good and make sure that we understand what else we want to do with that piece of land as well to help with the community. And so that's the first part. Then we get into uh, 2022, where we have the request uh, for for bidder for bidders, and that's really a request to qual for qualified bidders. And what we're trying to do here is find two or three potentially qualified consortiums or teams that can come in and actually build this asset. And so that's why we do this this pre tender phase, where we make sure that before we actually tender, which you see in 2023, we know that the two or three people are sorry, vendors that, that come in can actually build this and deliver this. And then what we do is we work with, again, um, you know, a local community with our local partners as well to do a little more detailed design as we get into the tender phase and then we tender. And then we contract award in 2024. And then construction usually takes about three years. Now, based on the tenders, we might see that construction takes about two, two and a half years at the earliest, but usually two and a half years to three years is, is probably the, the, the sweet spot. Now, the arrow at the bottom is, is really important to us because that's about the ongoing engagement. As you can see, it spans the life cycle of this project. And we want to make sure that there's ongoing public engagement throughout the project, that it's iterative, that we're making sure that we're hearing from our partners, that we're hearing from local. And so again, this is not the first time you're gonna hear from us. This is actually just the start of the journey and we wanna continue that relationship. When you look at other, uh, when you look at other uh, projects that we've done in Windsor, as well as uh, starting in Thunder Bay, I think what you will see is the local community, the local partners would say the same thing that we definitely engaged with them, that we interacted with them in an honest, authentic way. And then where we could, we helped um, you know, to the best means as possible in terms of making making uh, that asset expect acceptable to them, and so and so that is really our goal here is to really continue the, this 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 conversation throughout the project life. So, Angelo, maybe I'll hand it over to you to go a little more detail. Okay, um, so um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Um, so as mentioned earlier, there you know there's a significant due diligence activities that uh, Infrastructure Ontario will be performing over the next months. Uh, the site investigation work is required, of course, to do to inform the design of the facility um, on the property. Um, and it's um, and so what you're going to see over the next um, over the next few months, starting and over the next year, are, are activities on the site and. 
And um, so a lot of information gathering, a lot of investigations, uh, a lot of reporting, uh, all of this uh, will be fed into um, the design um, that uh, and specifications that we will be um, preparing um, in readiness to go to RFQ. So some of these things will be, you know, site servicing and transportation reporting. Uh, you'll see land surveyors out doing topographical planning. Uh, we'll start, we will start some of the um, uh, planning applications. We're going to be doing a lot of geotechnical environmental drilling. So you'll see, you will see machinery on site um, doing, um, doing a lot of these things. Uh, we'll also be investigating any uh, designated uh, um, uh, contamination on site if there is any for the uh, designated substance surveys. Uh, we will be starting the archaeological investigation. Of course, natural heritage is very important to us. And um, I talked a little bit earlier about the um, environmental assessment, the Class EA. Uh, we will be starting that uh, in the main in, in the spring. And so uh, all in all is to say that uh, there is activity and uh, you will actually uh, see it uh, over the coming months and over the next uh, over the next year. Thank you. So I would like to thank our panel for providing uh, an overview of the project. We will now be moving into the questions or comments area. Um, what I would just like to reiterate is as we prepare to field your questions or comments, I want to just go over the expected conduct during this part of the engagement session. So everyone is expected to conduct themselves in a respectful manner. Uh, again, disruptive or inappropriate conduct uh, will be muted by myself. Uh, I will provide one warning and you'll have a chance to continue and uh, hopefully we won't have to go beyond that. Again, I'm counting on your support during this period. With over 220 participants, we anticipate a lot of questions. So uh, as you, and I'll explain to you how to go through the questions to prepare your questions in a minute, but uh, our, the person receiving the questions will probably group them by theme if we get questions that are similar in, uh, in nature. It's also going to be very difficult to do follow-up questions given the technology. So if you do have a follow-up question, what I would recommend is that you add it into the chat. And if we have time, we'll get to it. Also, 